Thank you so much. Okay, so first of all, thanks everybody for being here, for choosing this talk uh, and uh, well, this session, and also thanks to the organizers for organizing this amazing conference. So um, the talk I'm going to um, present is actually uh, the summary of a paper called Of Maps and Grids. It just came out in the special issue Consciousness Science and Its Theories uh, in uh, Neuroscience of Consciousness. And it is a companion paper to another paper called Consciousness and the Fallacy of Misplaced Objectivity. And in order to tell you what the uh, Of Maps and Grids is about, I would like to just spend one word on the uh, fallacy of misplaced objectivity because it's quite important. The two papers really go, go as a pair. So the fallacy of misplaced objectivity or the code name FOMO <laughs> is the idea that there is this assumption that is very uh, interesting and very uh, well radicated in science that science provides objective explanations of objective phenomena such as the primary qualities that Galileo uh, referred to. But the fallacy of misplaced objectivity is really the idea that in particular theories of consciousness cannot and should not try to account for the subjective properties of consciousness precisely because a theory in order to be scientific can and should only account for the objective properties of any phenomenon. And in the case of consciousness, only the functions that accompany it because are really the objective part of consciousness, the stuff that we can measure. Well, so the idea of IIT is uh, to actually say, well, we shouldn't really commit this fallacy because we can and we should aim uh, for an objective explanation of the subjective properties of consciousness. Otherwise, we would really be missing out on what's very important about consciousness, which is its uh, subjective phenomenology. And the idea is that of maps and grids is just a simple example. I have to say, I'm afraid, very simple <laughs> to support this claim and to show of at least conceptually one way in which this task could be achieved. So now let's imagine I'm the experimenter and I just ask you, please uh, participant to my study, uh, just fixate the center of this dark screen. And as soon as there is a, a dot that appears like now, please move your eyes and fixate it. And you do exactly that. It appears a dot and you fixate it. You move your eyes and you fixate it. Well, no, now this function is, uh, is very trivial. It's simple, it's a fixation function that you can do mindlessly. But interestingly, um, the phenomenology that accompanies uh, such a trivial uh, task is actually quite rich, right? Because if I asked you to start describing your experience, well, you would say, yes, there was a black um, screen and then a white dot appeared and it was at a specific location and then I moved my eyes and the location changed. And uh, that specific location is actually one of many, many, many locations that you could have uh, flashed uh, the dot in. And all these locations also have a lot of relations between them because I can say that the central location of my visual field is sort of at a certain distance from the borders of my visual field. Um, it is uh, related, for instance, to other locations in my visual field. It's uh, included um, in other spots you could have highlighted uh, to my attention, and uh, it is partially overlapping with some other ones. So this phenomenology is actually pretty rich, even though what I asked you to do was a pretty simple task. So what we would like to uh, do is to take this rich phenomenology very seriously. For instance, the fact that in your visual field, there are plenty of phenomenal distinctions you can make and phenomenal relations that you can talk about and compare the explanation of consciousness in functional terms to an explanation of consciousness that really gets to these subjective properties that you talk about. And um, to do this, uh, of course, we have uh, started from some intuition that, and uh, not intuition, but some, some evidence that we have from the brain um, because we know that there are different subsystems in the brain, different pathways that perform similar functions, um, but some of these functions are accompanied by consciousness and some are not. So for instance, when we perform fixation functions, we know that there are some pathways that actually involve visual cortex and uh, parietal cortex and motor cortex and uh, result in an experience of a dot uh, located in space that we can then move our eyes to fixate. Um, but there are also other subcortical pathways, such as the ones that go directly, you know, through the optic nerve to the pretectum, 
um, that uh, allow us to fixate um, a dot uh, in our visual field, but without really uh, engaging consciousness that much. So the question here is, we can of course explain the functional properties of these two systems, but if we want to get to the subjective ones, what should we really do? So in our paper, what we've done is that we've built uh, two little systems um, that are all uh, basically performing a similar function. Let's say we have this artificial eye that has a, a retina that is uh, hit by rays of light uh, projected by uh, dots on a screen. And these rays of light hit the retina that then um, stimulates a central layer of neurons that then uh, stimulate four motors that allow the eye to move and to follow um, what well, basically to fovate, right? To fixate the point by changing the, 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 posi the relative position of the eye and the dot. And these two systems are what we call a grid system and a map system. And they are different in the following way. Sorry, I don't know how to have this disappear, but it's fine. Um, the idea is that in the grid system, the central layer is a set of units that have self loops but they're also connected by lateral connections in a uh, nearest neighbor connectivity uh, architecture. They're sort of a, like a lattice. Um, whereas like in the map system, the uh, retina layer and the motors are exactly the same. But the central layer is made of units that are not connected to each other with lateral connections. So the idea is that the receptors uh, stimulate the central units that then directly stimulate the motors and the central units don't actually interact with each other in this way effectively mapping the state of uh, the uh, retina to some sort of uh, state of the motors. And these two systems, I will not go into a lot of details um, about this because you can find everything in the paper and the simulation is of course very rich, but these two systems are basically built to uh, perform the same function. They are, first of all, behaviorally uh, equivalent in the sense that if you um, uh, let them, uh, if you run we run 2000 simulations of these two systems and we can show that the grid median and the map median, when we show a dot in uh, the uh, basic position that stimulates receptor A, the two systems eventually uh, move the motors, activate the motors so that the dot is then um, simulating receptor D in a very similar way. The two medians are basically identical. On top of that, we can also perform other interesting analysis. Um, for instance, we can ask, what are these systems representing? Well, both systems are retinotopic. We can pretend we are doing a little fMRI experiment where we are showing, we're stimulating locations in the retina and we are checking whether there is retinotopy or a mapping between the retina and the visual cortex. And in this case, by showing a dot in each um, input uh, uh, unit, then we find very similar responses, both in the uh, middle layer of the map and the grid. And similarly, we can also take the state of the, um, of the map and the grid and the state of the input to basically consider whether these systems are encoding information about the location of the stimulus and whether we can decode from uh, the state of mid the middle layer, um, the state of the, um, of the inputs, uh, sorry. Okay, so um, as I said, the two systems are representationally equivalent because you can see that the numbers are very similar. They perform with a approximation of 0 0.01 sometimes. Um, and not only on the representational side, but also on the input output function side, uh, these two systems are again performing in a very similar way. So we've built them so that um, based on the state um, of the input, uh, we can uh, predict very well the state of the outputs and both the map and the grid have this input output function that is very, um, very similar. On top of that, uh, we can also find that the two systems have very similar tuning functions. So we can take the state of the um, motors and we could consider the specificity of the tuning function of all these states. And again, we find five tuning functions that are pretty specific. And the, for the grid and the map, you see the two, uh, the black line and the red line are uh, very similar. So all these is just to say, we build these two systems uh, 
as similar as possible, not identical, because interestingly, in the brain, there's plenty of systems that differ slightly in what they're, um, they're doing, but uh, the input output function is basically the same. But now um, we want to ask the question, are these behavioral representation and functional uh, equivalencies enough to account for the conscious experience of a system? And again, in this case, um, we built these two systems to be equivalent on these aspects, precisely to ask this question. And one first answer is, well, no, because remember the FOMO. You don't want to miss out on what really matters, right? Which is phenomenology. And phenomenology is subjective, whereas like all these um, properties that we just uh, described are objective. Um, but on top of this, there is also, again, this practical consideration that there are plenty of systems in the brain that if we just consider the behavior, representations or uh, functions would look like they're doing exactly the same thing. But we know firsthand that sometimes the same function can be performed with or without phenomenology. So how can we uh, go beyond this? And how can basically we can try to explain objectively these subjective properties that in this case, this um, uh, in this picture are completely missing? Well, the proposal of IIT is that um, we can take these two systems and uh, instead of focusing on their representational properties or functional properties, we have to focus on their cause effect power, meaning the intrinsic causal powers that the systems are actually specifying. And the idea of IIT is long story short that of course we can unfold the cause effect structure of each of these two systems, in this case, focusing only on the middle layer, which is the one that is relevant and the one that also has uh, feedback connections uh, and, and loops. So if we unfold the cause-effect structure of the grid, we find a rich cause-effect structure that even for a system of just seven units has more than 70 distinctions and a ton of relations between them. Whereas like if we unfold the map as a system, well, this system is, as you can imagine, is trivially reducible in the sense that there is there are many cuts that make no difference to the system. And the idea is that it literally disintegrates into seven separate systems that specify a smidget of causal power and they don't really interact with each other. So now, why is this important? Why should we even care about unfolding cause effect structures if our goal is to study phenomenology? Well, because the point is that the hypothesis of IIT and, and uh, the, the test of IIT is really to show that by unfolding the causal powers of a system, we can find properties that then we can put in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the properties of phenomenology. And uh, in this case, um, we can show that the uh, system, while it goes through the uh, steps of the fixation of a specific dot, goes through many different states. But the experience that accompanies fixation in humans, of course, um, is characterized by a lot of spatial relations that characterize all these different states, right? We know, for instance, that when we see something in a specific location, let's call it A, and then we move our eyes, and now that bright dot is now in location B, and then in location C, and then in D, which is the center of our visual field, all these locations have, for instance, neighboring properties. They are neighbors in our visual field. And interestingly, if we now try to just remove the labels that we've put uh, extrinsically on top of these uh, systems, we can see that the cause effect structure of the map, which is on top, uh, doesn't really tell us anything about the intrinsic spatial properties of these um, different uh, locations in space. Whereas like the cause effect structure of a grid has uh, substructures that define specifically all the spatial properties of um, that the system specifies in different states. And thank you. Ultimately, what we would like to do is that we would like an objective physical explanation of our phenomenology, which means that there should really be a mapping um, between phenomenology and properties of a cause effect structure that uh, explains every phenomenal distinction in terms of a phenomenal, um, a physical, sorry, a physical distinction, a causal distinction. And the same goes for every relation between this phenomenal distinction should correspond to a relation between these physical distinctions. And to see all the details of the computations and all the um, physical uh, description of how to unfold the cause of structure and what it means actually to have a physical distinction and a physical relation, I invite you to check 
Hon and Tononi's paper um, from 2019, uh, which we call the Space Paper, that was published in Entropy. So, what is the conclusion, the take-home message? Well, I think the first is really try to avoid <laughs> both the fallacy of misplaced objectivity, but also avoid missing out on what are the relevant properties that um, we should try to explain, the subjective properties of experience. Um, it is uh, true that uh, theories of consciousness should objectively explain these subjective properties. And this is not only probably possible, but it can be done by going only beyond function and uh, representation and uh, behavioral equivalence. In our paper, we just show a simple example reminiscent of different systems in the brain. And we show that if you just stick to behavior representation and function, you can't really get to uh, the intrinsic difference between these two systems. But you, if you unfold the cause effect power of the two systems, you can find these intrinsic spatial properties that characterize phenomenology, uh, for instance, when we humans do some sort of like fixation function. That's it. Thank you so much.